All righty. Well, good morning, everybody. So uh, today we are going to be continuing our sermon series, uh, The Heart of Royalty. Uh, so if you've been with us, kind of been uh, watching online, uh, or if this is the first time that you're hearing about it, we have been uh, looking at into uh, some of this newfound wisdom that we always hear about. And so today, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about some of that, that wisdom that uh, kind of gets... Uh, misappropriately applied, right? So uh, we're going to talk about a, a portion of Solomon's life, uh, but with his wisdom comes all kinds of stuff, and unfortunately, uh, this portion of his wisdom is what ultimately tears him down, and we're going to talk about it, which uh, gets left out when talking about Solomon. Uh, the subject of uh, his life that we're going to be looking at is his love life, uh, because, you know, some of you who have loved and lost, you understand that sometimes that's your downfall, and, you know, we've all been there. Uh, a game called uh, Proverb, or it was uh, Slogan or Solomon. Uh, some of you, maybe you Proverbs, because you were like, I did not do as well as I would have liked. Uh, maybe you wanted a chance at, a chance at redemption today. Uh, we have another game. So, love song or song of Solomon. So, we have a game. All, all right, we need some, some group participation here. So, everybody, you know, I'll pass on this one. Uh, but I did see you guys all, you know, walking around and meeting each other and things like that. So we're going to play a game. Uh, if you did really well last week, uh, now's your chance to hold the title. So we'll, we'll see how this goes. So love song or song of Solomon. Uh, we're going to have some lyrics, right? So these lyrics either come from a book of song of Solomon. So let's go ahead and put the first one up. Your love is better than wine. So over here, we're going to have Solomon. If you think King Solomon and all of his of uh, the subject of love said this, you're going to stand over here. If you think this was from a popular love song or maybe a not so popular love song, you're going to stand over on this side. Okay? So you guys can come to a decision, think about what you think, and then uh, Solomon or we have a love song. So who knows, maybe the Beatles wrote it. I don't know, the Beatles didn't really write a whole lot of love songs. I don't know, Maroon 5. I don't know how many of you guys would know. A few, okay. All that matters. All right, let's go ahead with the answer reveal. Solomon. So King Solomon said it. It's the Tongue of Solomon. Let's go to the next one. Then I kiss your eyes and thank God that we're together. Is that a love song or is that Song of Solomon? That or was that, you know, Justin Bieber? Who knows? Okay. So we've got we've got quite a few answers. Love song. So it was indeed from a love song. All right, we got another. Love song. Oh, are we out? Okay. There we go. You will always be love's great martyr, and I will be a fool. Solomon or love song? For those of you who held the title, how's it going this time? All right, let's see the answer. Love song. All right. Let's go ahead and do another. We got a few of these. So if you're, if this is just not going your way, we have plenty of, uh, plenty of opportunities. I will think of you every step. Is that a love song or is that Solomon? We got Solomon, we got a love song. Stay in put, okay. Oh, a lot of people on, okay, let's see the answer. Love. All right, 
Next. You are altogether beautiful. Is that a love song or is that? This is like, I can't, I'll be honest. I didn't fact check these to make sure that they weren't in love songs. It's not like I know every single love song on the planet. I didn't like go through and memorize Song of Solomon. I should, but I didn't. All right, let's see the end. His book on love. All right, let's do, let's just do one more. Okay, so this is your final chance of redemption. I know all of the things that make you who you are. Say to his lovely bride, or if you read the book of Song of Solomon, maybe the, uh, the wife says it to the man. That is an option. Or is that a love song? I know all the things that make you who you are. All right. All right, you guys can go ahead and have a seat. Good job. Thank you for thank you for being such willing participants. I hope that you know what? I'm going to give some always given to me is like if you're not married, don't go read Song of Solomon. Go read Song of Solomon, it's fine. Uh There's some weird stuff in there, but just pretend that you're a mature adult and it's going to be okay. Uh, so, Song of Solomon was a, a book that was written uh, by Solomon, and it was really kind of this, this poetic the idea is that uh, it's meant to be this ideal way of how people ought to love one another, and uh, let's just say Solomon had a lot of experience when it comes to love. And so, today as we look, we're going to be looking at 1 Kings chapter 11. Now, 1 Kings chapter 11... Uh, to give you some, some insight and some backstory, if you remember from last week, we talked about uh, Solomon wanting to lead his nation well. He wanted to, to lead uh, We have right motives that just the execution doesn't go according to plan. You know, uh, we have good motives for what we do, uh, but when we actually get to uh, accomplishing these motives and accomplishing these dreams and these ideals, we go about it in the wrong way. Uh, when uh, Solomon first comes to the throne, is that he immediately takes the wife of Pharaoh's daughter, right? So the Pharaoh of Egypt becomes uh, Solomon's wife, and it establishes this good diplomatic uh, right to uh, superpowers of the ancient world coming together. And so in my head, here's how this plays out. In my head, uh, Solomon is very happy with the outcome. He's happy. And in order to establish more and more power and more and more security in Israel, he seeks all of these marriages to people who are outside and ultimately ends up with, as we'll come to find, 700 wives. Now, some of you. I can't hardly handle one wife, let alone 700 more. That's not including the 300, you know, like, kind of side chicks that he had. Like, this is a rough position to be in. I'm just going to throw that out there. But uh, think for political gain and, and all that good stuff. Kings chapter 11, verse 1 through 13. We're just going to read through. We're going to plow through. King Solomon loved many foreign women in addition to Pharaoh's daughter, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidi, Sidonian, and Hittite women from the nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with you because they will turn your heart away to follow their gods. To these women, Solomon was deeply attached in love. He had 700 wives who were princesses, and, th and they turned his heart away. And we're gonna, I want to go ahead and pause there. Uh, as I was kind of researching and getting ready for this sermon, I came across this term that I didn't really uh, understand. I had to, like, Google this bad boy because, you know, that's what you do nowadays. We live in the Internet age. And so uh, this 
phrase about Solomon is that he had feet of clay. Are any of you familiar with that term, feet of clay? Awesome. I'm not the only one. All right. So Google will tell you that feet of clay is this. Uh, so it's this hidden uh, kind of downfall. It's this hidden issue within a person who is seemingly strong and unbreakable. Right? So uh, according to, to my research, Solomon's feet of clay It was the fact that he couldn't say no, and it was, his, it was this fact that he was obsessed with uh, being with all of these women. Now, many of you who probably watch movies and TV and dramas like I do, you probably realize, like, man, he did pretty good to make it to 700. Like, I've seen, I've seen main characters cave after two, right? Like, I watch a lot of drama. I'll be honest. Rom-com. No, I probably don't look like I would be, but I am. Uh, so here we have Solomon kind of in this situation where he is obsessing over finding not just political power and not just emotionally attached to these people. And many of us can probably relate to Solomon in this situation. Have you ever been emotionally attached to somebody? And it causes you to like not, you know, like, let's be honest. You know that you shouldn't do something, but you do. Uh, as a guy who has like, you know, dated before, uh, you know, like, there was this deal I've ever had, not dating her just for the record. But uh, we go to this restaurant, right? Uh, believe it or not, we go to Longhorn Steakhouse. And uh, so... We're there, and her sister is like the waiter, and so I'm trying to make a good impression. So, like, we get the bill, which is more than I should have spent anyway. But, you know, like, I'm a... You want three steaks? Go for it. You know, like, you know, whatever you got to do. And then, of course, her sister's like the waiter, and she, like, brings the bill. And I'm like, oh, good thing I just got a job that... Line, like, woo! -hoo! And so... Uh, you know, so I'm like on this date and her sister brings the bill and I'm like trying to make a good impression on her and her sister because I have to be well liked. So I like slap a 20 on the tip. And uh, I wish I could say that uh, emotions have, have been not the downfall of me and have not led me to do really dumb things, uh, but they have. I have done dumb things out. Uh, I'm one of those people, like, when I get emotional and I'm in, like, a bad mental state, I do, like, retail therapy. Are, is it, am I the only one like that? Does anybody else, like, you find yourself in a bad place mentally and you're like, I'm buying something. I brought a rain suit. I bought a rain suit. Like, I was sad. I had just gone through a... And, you know, I was, like, 12, you know, and not really. Unfortunately, I wish I could say I was 12. I was definitely in college. Uh... I bought a rain suit because I was upset. And oftentimes when we find ourselves making these, these poor decisions because we're just not thinking clearly. And so now Solomon has already broken the command of God. God tells all of Israel that they are not to intermarry. Do not marry these people because focus your heart on things that are not of me. And I'm sure Solomon, in all of his God-given wisdom, quite literally, he probably thought, ah, oh, not me. That'll never be me. I can marry. I can do all this stuff. It's not going to happen to me. God, I'm doing this for you. Like, I'm doing this for your people. I have to have these 700 wives. Like, these are 700 nations that aren't going to attack us. Like, this is a good thing, right? And so as he continues to make these small little compromises, he finds himself in this bad situation where he is turning away. His heart has turned away. He was not wholeheartedly devoted to the Lord, his God, and as his father uh, David had been. Solomon followed Ashtoreth the goddess of the Sidonians, and Milcom, the abhorrent idol of the Ammonites. Solomon did what was evil in the Lord's sight, and unlike his father David, he did not remain loyal to the Lord. 
At that time, Solomon built a high place for Kamash, the abhorrent idol of Moab, and for Milk of the Ammonites on the hill across from Jerusalem. He did the same for all his foreign wives who were burning incense and offering sacrifices to their gods. Solomon finds himself in this place. He has uh, given his heart away to all of these different women who uh, have this very horrible appears strong to fight the, 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 despite the fact that he is uh, this wise king, this wise ruler, he allows himself to compromise. And as he does so, he finds himself doing things that he likely never believed he would. Just last week when we looked at uh, 1 Kings chapter 3, Solomon goes in that he is going to lead according to the statutes of David. His goal was to always love the Lord with his entire heart, just as his father had. And here, he's already being compared to his father. His heart turned away. He was not devout. He was not faithful. Everything David had done, despite his flaws, despite his mistakes, to his grave, his heart was focused on the Lord. And here, Solomon strays. Where once he had his heart set on what was good and godly, now it is set on just kind of going through the motions. Right? The, the text never just didn't believe in God. Right? It's not one of those stories where like uh, he completely walks away from faith, completely walks away from God. He just simply believes that God is a God among the many. Uh, all of these, these women who believe in these different gods, uh, he allows them to burn offerings to them, to burn incense. He allows them to, to bring their, their false beliefs into his own household and into the heart of the nation that was supposed to be from God. Have you ever found yourself in a similar position? You're like, I've never burnt incense to somebody named Kamash. That's never happened. But have you ever found yourself making compromises? Have you ever found yourself out things kind of life and you've, you've said, well, God, it's really a good thing. You ever done the flirt to convert thing? I've been there. Maybe you guys don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, let me put it to you this way. Guy A likes girl. Christian. Guy A is a Christian, and you think, well, what better way to bring her to Christ than to date her? Like, if we just date, like, we'll always hang out, we'll always be around each other, like, we're just gonna, we're, we're gonna be awesome, and, you know, like, and I'm always in church, they'll come to church, you know, I love the Lord, and they want to love what I want to love, and, you know, you're 12, and so you don't know better, and, uh, you know, you're like, they're gonna come to church, they're going to love the Lord just like I do. You ever found yourself in a position like that? You ever found yourself in the complete opposite situation where all the things you told yourself you would never do? You told yourself, oh, they'll change. They'll be better. They'll be different. I'll bring them to church. They're gonna, their heart's going to change just like mine did. Everything's going to pan out. And then you find yourself in this situation and you're like, wait a second. Eight weeks. Wait a second. Uh, we haven't been living according to what the Bible has always told me I was supposed to do in, as, a, as a Christian man or as a Christian woman. Have you ever found yourself bringing things into your life because you thought maybe you would just be able to change somebody? I'm sure Solomon's not a, a relationship. I just happen to be focusing on that because like Song of Solomon and, you know, Solomon's like a thousand people that he was in love with. Uh, you ever found yourself surrounded by friends? And you think, man, if I could just put myself in their place, see my heart, and, you know, they're just going to have to come to church. You know, I'm going to invite them to church, and you have this, this great idea, uh, but you meet them on their ground because you think that's where they're at, and, you know, God wants me to go to them. Uh, you ever found yourself backsliding? 
It's all of these things that uh, you used to do and you think I have to meet them there because, you know, that's how I was saved. And you think that just because it happened to you means that it's going to happen to these other people. And so you find art. And while I've been there myself and while I've put myself in these positions, uh, even even myself, uh, it very seldom works that way. If you really want to, to bring people to the Lord, if you really want to, to have an influence, meet in a place where you're not going to be equally tempted. That was Solomon's mistake. And that's a mistake that many of us make. Find yourself on common ground. Maybe rather than doing what, whatever they're doing, maybe drink coffee, I drink coffee, let's drink coffee and, you know, we'll just meet up. That's a very uh, wise place to meet. Find other common ground that's not going to be a struggle because I promise can't hash it out, can't make it. I promise we're not going to be any different. We're going to fall. We're going to make mistakes. Solomon had the, the wisdom that was given by God himself and still he fell because he allowed himself to. And we can fall prey to that as well. Picking up in verse 9, it says this. The Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord twice. He had commanded him about this so that he would not follow other gods. But Solomon did not do what the Lord commanded. Then the Lord said to Solomon, since you have done this and did not keep my covenant and my statutes, which I commanded you, to your servant. However, I will not do it during your lifetime for the sake of your father, David. I will tear it out of your son's hand. Yet I will not tear the entire one tribe to your son for the sake of my servant, David, and for the sake of Jerusalem that I chose. Solomon's compromises had dire consequences. The reign of David and was promised to Solomon was taken away because he chose to abandon his one true love. You see, oftentimes we find ourselves Solomon uh, clearly tried to, to fill it with political power. He tried to fill it with, with love and uh, with money and with, with all of this influence. And he tried to fill it with all of these things. And if he had only stayed true to who he was originally, he would have realized that all of Ecclesiastes is all about how these very things that he falls prey to are vain and they, they don't fill the void. That ultimately only God fills the and and oftentimes we find ourselves in the same place, right? We we seek love in all the wrong places. You know, uh, we we just we want to be loved. We want to feel loved, and and we always look towards other people for it. We look towards uh, to towards parents. We we look towards uh, people who have walked away from our lives. We look marriages and, and all of these different things and we look towards these things that can't really fill no matter how hard we try because we're looking towards people who are broken just like us. Look towards these people who have the exact same holes in their hearts and we look towards incomplete people to make us complete. Or some people, uh, they, they push away that stuff and they try to fill this void and this, this hole in their heart with, with money. They chase uh, family away and, and work towards their, their goals and they want to climb the corporate ladder. And they think, if I could just make this amount of money, I'll be happy. And then they make that amount of money and it's not enough. And so they, make, they think, oh, if I could just make find themselves in this place where despite all the money that they've come to, they're just not happy. They chase power. They think, if I can just step into uh, the government, if I can just become maybe just mayor. You know, if I can, if I can be mayor, and mayor's not good enough, and they're like, you know what, I think I'm going to run for governor. 
I'll be governor, like, then I'll be happy, I'll be filled. The governor's not enough, and they're like, you know what? I had a good run as governor. I'll run for, like, the Senate. So then they run for Senate, and, you know, they think, oh, if I can just fill that seat, you know, if people can just vote for me, if I'm just clearly well-liked and I can establish this power, you know, then, then I'll have meaning in my life. And then that's not enough, so they run for president, and then they realize that they're what has all that power amounted to? The void is still there. I've always heard the, the kind of cliche term in all of our hearts that only God can fill. But we constantly find ourselves trying to fill it with other things. And it's just not going to work. It's like being hungry and trying to just drink enough water to where you're full and satisfied. There's one thing that fills the void, and there's one thing that unites all people, and there's one thing that fills that little God-shaped heart in our heart. Now, it's self-implied in the name. It's God. I've known many people who have looked to find satisfaction in worldly things, and they've looked towards material things, only to find themselves uh, involved in, in church, find theirself, themselves uh, giving their lives to Christ, and suddenly all of the things that they used to look to, they realize there's just, there's nothing really there. But they're satisfied Christ, so my question to you is this what do you try to fill that heart that, that hole with that that thing that seems to just be missing in your life what do you try to fill it with do you fill it with friends do you fill it with with relationships do you try to fill it with with influence popularity regardless of what it is do you try to fill it with those things or do you try to fill it with the lord let's pray Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us. We thank you for his sacrifice on the cross all those years ago. God, that he was willing to do that just so that we can be reunited with you. God, that, that the brokenness that we live in, that the, the faults that we have, God, that you would overlook those. Family. And God, you do this because you love us and because you deeply care about us. God, I pray that we wouldn't try to fill holes and, and voids with pass away. God, that we would try to fill it with you, who's eternal. God, we thank you and we praise you. And it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Now is the time for invitation, so if you have uh, any prayer requests, any decisions that you would like to make, uh, now final song.